Um, welcome to everyone who's attending today. I know that these times are very stressful, strange, scary, and more for everyone. Um, and there's a lot of questions coming up from many different regulatory angles. And so today we're here to talk about the impact of HIPAA and COVID-19. And so I'm hoping to answer a lot of your questions today. Um, I've been carefully reviewing all of the Office for Civil Rights materials um, and news releases on this topic. And so I'm gonna be covering a lot of the things that they have explained in detail today. And of course, as Shauna mentioned, please feel free to type your questions into the box. And then at the end of the webinar, um, Shauna will present those questions and I'll provide some answers um, as, as much as I am able. So thank you for joining today. I hope you get a lot out of this. Um, our, my contact information is present here. Um, as you can see on the first slide, um, our company website, our email address and our phone number are available. Um, our company uh, was founded in 1988 and we began doing seminars all over the country on OSHA compliance. Of course, HIPAA did not exist at that time. And so we were focused on OSHA compliance and helping medical and dental practices all over the country comply with OSHA guidelines. And then of course, as other regulations came about, we began to expand um, our expertise into HIPAA, the OIG fraud, waste and abuse prevention for Medicare and Medicaid programs, CLIA regulations for laboratories, et cetera. Um, so if you need any assistance with any of your compliance efforts, please get in touch with us. We'd be happy to help you out. As Shauna mentioned, we are um, the endorsed vendor from the MDA for compliance services, and there are special discounts available to MDA members. So let us know if we can help. Um, and as Shauna also mentioned, I have been with Eagle Associates since 1992. Um, and I'm happy to um, share my expertise and knowledge with you today. Um, I did go to the University of Michigan. If you went to Michigan State, I promise we can be friends. Um, if you went to Ohio State, we're gonna have to talk. So talk to me after. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. We do have a lot of material to cover here today. Um, the things we're going to talk about today uh, include civil rights and HIPAA and some information that the Office for Civil Rights has published about that topic. Of course, we are going to have some time at the end for your questions, so please go ahead and type those in now, as we mentioned. We're going to talk about telehealth. So telehealth is one of the, the biggest things that has come up as the COVID-19 epidemic has gone along, and so we'll be discussing the HIPAA ramifications of the use of telehealth and some of the information that has been provided. We're gonna look at disclosures to various different parties, including first responders, friends and family, et cetera. We're gonna take a look at some of the operational issues that might be affecting your practice relative to HIPAA and in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we're gonna look at some malware, phishing and teleconference hacking that unfortunately is cropping up in the wake of the epidemic um, unfortunately, some bad actors are trying to capitalize on the pandemic, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Our first topic is telehealth, and so the Office for Civil Rights has offered some relief for telehealth during this period. So the first really most important point to cover here is that all of the HIPAA rules, the privacy rule and the security rule, are not suspended during this time. So I've had some practices contact me and say, well, hey, you know, HIPAA is put on hold right now. And that's actually not true. But there has been published a discretion that the Office for Civil Rights has to not impose penalties for non-compliance related to the specific good faith use of telehealth during the emergency period. So that's where the flexibility is coming in for enforcement. It's not relative to suspending the entire HIPAA regulations. Telehealth is where the waiver has been provided. So let me explain a little bit more about how that waiver for telehealth is working. Right now, during the emergency period, which has been announced, there will be no penalties for the temporary use of a non-secure telehealth application during the pandemic until further notice. 
So what's going to happen is the Office for Civil Rights will announce when the emergency period is ending where this waiver will no longer be in place. Because normally, if you're going to use telehealth or pro provide healthcare via a telehealth application, you have to obtain a business associate with the provider and the provider has to have a secure method of providing telehealth services. However, during these unprecedented times where practices have had to deploy telehealth applications with very little notice, with very little time for preparation, transition, et cetera, there will be no penalty if you use a non-secure telehealth application during this time. One thing that the Office for Civil Rights has emphasized is that they do still want you to inform patients that, hey, here's an option. We can do some telehealth to do some consulting, help me determine if you have a dental emergency, come up with some possible treatment options that may not require you to come into the practice, decide if you need to come into the practice for emergency care. Um, but you still wanna inform the patient that, hey, we have telehealth available as an option. The option we've chosen is or is not secure depending on what you have. And at least inform the patient that, hey, there may be some risks here with the use of this telehealth application. Um, do you still wanna move forward with that option? And so if you are using a non-secure telehealth application, then you wanna inform the patient that there are some possible risks to privacy with the use of that application. So again, the enforcement discretion is related only to telehealth, not general privacy and security rules, which are still in effect during this time. Um, but if you did experience a breach as the result of the good faith provision of telehealth, using a non-secure app, there would be no penalties during this time. So, you know, if you decided, hey, we're going to do some telehealth, here's the app we're using, and then unfortunately a breach occurs, you would not be penalized at this time as long as your use was in good faith, which we'll get to um, a little bit more in just a moment. Another point to bring up is that the discretion applies to telehealth used for any reason. The telehealth service does not have to only be related to the diagnosis or treatment of COVID-19. It can be used for any purpose, including dentistry. Like I said, the, the attempt to determine if someone is experiencing a dental emergency, providing some consultation, et cetera. So you can use telehealth for any health purpose during this time. It does not have to be related to COVID-19 in any way. Let's move on to a couple other points regarding telehealth. The first one is public facing versus non-public facing technology. So in this enforcement discretion, you still may not use public facing communication applications. That means you, you may not use Facebook Live, TikTok, Twitch, anything that the general public can access at will can still not be used for telehealth. There are many apps, however, that are non-public facing, such as Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts video, Zoom, Skype, GoToMeeting, WebEx, all of those may be used for telehealth provision. In addition to that, some of these applications actually use an encryption of their streams, but you are not currently required to confirm that during the emergency period. However, the Office for Civil Rights is encouraging the use of encryption if possible. So if you already have an account with something like a GoToMeeting, by all means use it because they use an encrypted connection. But again, if you are trying to help your patients, you're using what's available to you, you've come up with something that does not have an encrypted stream, that is fine for now. And then whatever app that you have selected, you wanna take some time to enable all available privacy and security controls that are present in that application. So anything that the application is offering you for privacy and security, make sure that you deploy that as you are able to do. So you just wanna look at settings, review security documentation from the application, 
and enable those settings as you're able to. In addition, you can use audio only communication products for telehealth. So if you, know, you don't have or you don't need video, you can use an audio communication product to consult with a patient that does not have to be secure again during this time. Um, obviously, if you're on the telephone with a patient, that's fine. But if you're doing some type of a telephone audio application, that's fine as well. Um, another question that came up is, what about if a patient wants to send a provider a photo of their, their dental condition, whatever's going on with them? Um, is that permissible in this situation? The answer is yes. And actually, even in normal times, patients can send you information any way they want. They, if they decide to send you information in a non-secure manner, you are not in a state of non-compliance. However, it's always nice as a courtesy to tell a patient, hey, you know, you can send me anything any way you want, but just so you know, if you send me something via regular email, technically that's not secure. So it's always nice to have as a courtesy communicate to patients who may not be familiar with the risks of certain things. But yes, patients can send you photos to assist in your remote diagnosis, consultation, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, if you need to send something back to them, again, the security rule is not suspended. So normally, if you're sending something to a patient that includes their protected health information of any kind, you would do that via a secure method, if at all possible, unless the patient is requesting you to send their information to them, and they've asked you to send it via regular email, you've counseled them as to the risks of regular email, and the patient still wants you to send it anyway. That is actually something that's in effect all the time as well. So under the patient's right of access, the patient has the right, of course, to ask you for a copy of their record or a portion of that record. And then under right of access, you have 30 calendar days to provide the copy that they're asking for. So again, even in normal times, if a patient is asking you for their record or a portion of it, and they ask you to email the record, as long as you counsel them as to the risks of regular email, if they insist that they're fine accepting those risks and they want you to continue, you should send the information via email if you have that ability. Now, I personally strongly recommend that if a patient is asking you to send them information via unencrypted email, that you document that in their record, either with a verbal or you can obtain a written um, documentation that they accepted the risks. That's up to you as to how you wanna document that, but you wanna document number one, that you communicated the risks and that the patient accepted those risks, whether you do that in a verbal note in their chart or you obtain um, a written request. And an easy way to do that when you're getting a written request, a lot of practices already require a form to be filled out when a patient's requesting a copy of their record. So in that, you could add a note to that form that simply says, if you are asking us to send us information via regular email, please check here or initial here to acknowledge that you're accepting the risks of regular email and explain that regular email is not secure. So that is an easy thing that you can do and add some notation to your existing records request form. Another note regarding records request forms because of the times we're in and we're not seeing patients in person right now for most cases, you can facilitate the filling out and return of a records request form or an authorization form remotely. So you can email or fax or mail the patient the blank form. And again, they can return it to you any way they want. And so um, the, all of that whole process can be facilitated remotely. You can do your, your standard identity verification procedures by checking the patient's signature against one you have on file. Um, or if you get a piece of paperwork that says it's from the patient and you're not feeling confident, you're always welcome to call the patient and say, hey, you know what? I got this form. It says it's from you. 
I had a feeling I wasn't sure. I just wanted to confirm that this is what you sent us and this is what you want. So those are some notes on that. Um, let's go on to the Office for Civil Rights has provided a listing of vendors that already represent to have HIPAA compliant telehealth products. So these ones that are listed here are not endorsed by the Office for Civil Rights, but the Office for Civil Rights provided this list just so that you're aware that these vendors purport to have HIPAA compliant products and they've indicated that they will sign a business associate agreement. So we have Skype for Business, not regular Skype, but Skype for Business, Updocs, VC, Zoom for Healthcare, again, not just regular Zoom, but the Zoom for Healthcare product, they'll sign a business associate agreement, Doxy.me, Google G Suite Hangouts Meet, Cisco WebEx Meeting or WebEx Teams, Amazon Chime, GoToMeeting, and Spruce Healthcare Messenger. All of these products um, you know, are already possibly HIPAA compliant. Uh, the OCR has not investigated all those claims and checked everything. But again, right now, you're not required to verify everything anyway. So, um, but if you're already working with one of these products, you're already using probably a secure product. I recommend getting their security paper so you can take a look at what they're doing. Um, but these things are available and here's a nice list for you um, of products that you can look into if you don't already have a product selected. Next, the Office for Civil Rights communicated, here's some things that you should look for when you're choosing a telehealth product. Um, number one, a lot of products offer end-to-end -end encryption as part of their just standard procedure for using a, um, a conference or meeting app. And then does the application allow for individual user accounts so that each person who uses it logs in themselves, pass codes, things like that. Um, I know that um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about some of the security issues with some things. I know everyone's familiar with people getting Zoom bombed and things like that. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, but pass codes can be one way to kind of gatekeep. If you have people coming into a telehealth conference, use of passcodes can keep unauthorized people from, from accessing your session. Then another note is something we wanna talk about is practicing telehealth in a private setting. So the Office for Civil Rights, even though there's this exception for use of a non-secure application right now, a private setting is still expected for provision of telehealth services to a patient. So that just means you should not be in a public park where passersby could see information. You know, you might be working out of your home right now and that's fine. The things that you can do inside your home to ensure privacy from other occupants are closing the room door, lowering your voice, being aware of, okay, you know, hey, if I'm gonna be doing teleconferences that need some privacy, maybe I'll be on one floor and the other people in my home might be on a different floor during that time. Or like I said, you're closing the door you're, you're being conscious of your tone of voice um, that's being used the, and lowering your volume some. Those are all safeguards that you can practice to make sure that um, your telehealth session is as private as possible. So the next item we're going to look at is the bad faith provision of telehealth because we wanna avoid this situation because penalties would apply here. Um, as I mentioned before, there would be no penalty for the good faith use of telehealth, but if there is bad faith use of telehealth, then you would still be subject to enforcement action and penalties. So let's take a look at some things that would constitute a bad faith provision or use of telehealth. First of all, selling PHI. I mean, that sounds obvious um, that you cannot take your patient information and sell it to another party for any reason. That is a violation of the HIPAA privacy rule violating professional ethical standards. So, you know, as a provider, as a dentist, um, as a hygienist, whatever your situation is right now, you are familiar with the ethical standards of your profession and you should not violate those standards when providing telehealth, just as you would not violate them during regular face-to-face -face sessions. And then again, finally, do not use public facing applications because those could be subject to penalties. So you know, Facebook Live, TikTok, and Twitch, 
if you used one of those public facing applications, you would be subject to enforcement action and potential penalties. So um, in the midst of this situation, patients still have the right to file a complaint if they feel there's been a violation of their privacy. So that has not been suspended during this time. So it's possible that if you used Facebook Live for a patient session and they said, hey, wait a minute, I thought we were gonna have a private session here. This I don't think was right. They could complain about that and that's something that could still be investigated during this time. We're gonna move on now and talk about some disclosure issues. But again, if you have any questions on telehealth that I didn't answer, go ahead and type those in the box now and Shauna will present those at the end of our session. I'm gonna make sure and leave some time for questions at the end. So the first type of disclosure we're gonna talk about that has been permitted during this emergency period is that to first responders. So. You know, this will not come up as much for dentistry, obviously, as it would for other settings. However, um, if you need to disclose to law enforcement, paramedics, first responders, public health authorities, you can do so without the individual's authorization at this time um, if they need it to provide treatment to the individual. So, um, you know, a medical transport personnel, you know, if you are treating a patient, for example, who has a dental emergency and suddenly they have a health situation that necessitates you to contact EMS, you can disclose that whether or not they are known to have COVID-19 if that was needed to protect the other people who are going to be involved in providing care to that patient. Another situation is if there is a required disclosure that's required by law, for example, for infectious diseases. So, you know, the state and local health departments need to know if someone has COVID-19, you can disclose that information to an authorized representative of a public health official, the CDC, a state or local health department as needed to help prevent the control or spread of the disease. So um, you're able to make that disclosure as needed on an ongoing basis to the CDC or local health department on any issues related to known or suspected um, COVID-19 or um, exposures that you become aware of in the course of doing your business. So all of these are permitted without any authorization being required from the patient. Friends and family. So this one is an interesting situation. And this, this is something that comes up a lot, even in the non-emergent period. So there's a couple of different situations that come up with disclosures to friends and family. First of all, if the patient is able to consent, you should get consent from the patient before sharing information to a friend or family member who's not already listed on a valid HIPAA authorization. However, if the patient is unconscious or incapacitated, you can share relevant information about the patient with family or friends or others involved in their care. If you determine that in your professional judgment, it's in the best interest of the patient to do so. But you should always limit that disclosure to the minimum necessary to accomplish the current purpose. So, you know, you would just limit the information to the current situation and information that's needed for that person to assist the patient. You wouldn't also disclose information about a previous condition or other things that are not relevant to the current situation. And then for example, um, you know, you might be dealing with an elderly patient. And so you could share relevant information with their adult child, but you wouldn't share other information about their other history without permission from the patient, especially if they're able to give you permission. Um, when they're incapacitated, of course, then you can use your professional judgment. Now, you are also allowed to disclose information to people who are at risk of either contracting the disease or spreading the disease if it's necessary to prevent or control the spread of disease and to carry out public health interventions. So, for example, during this health emergency, the local public health departments are assisting all kinds of entities and businesses and so forth in 
contact tracing, other types of things. And whenever there's a case that's reported, you might get asked for information from your local public health department. Um, you are permitted to disclose that information as necessary to help carry that out. Um, but again, you use that minimum necessary standard to restrict the amount of information disclosed to the minimum necessary to accomplish that current purpose. Another thing um, I wanted to mention here is that of course, um, you know, if you have someone who comes into the practice and you find out later that they were positive for coronavirus and you didn't know about it at the time, then you might need to contact your staff and other patients who might have been in contact with that person to let them know that they've been exposed. That would be something that you would do in coordination with the local public health department. So you'd contact them and say, okay, here's what happened. This, you know, a patient was here in our practice on this date. We, they contacted us and notified us after their appointment that they had the virus and didn't know it at that time. And here's all the people that were there that day and the health department will assist you. They might make some of the notifications, they might ask you to, but again, you can make those disclosures as needed during this time. Another type of disclosure that you are allowed to make at any time is to prevent or reduce a serious and imminent threat to health and safety of a person or the public. So again, this kind of goes hand in hand with the situation that's going on. You're able to disclose an information to anyone who's in a position to prevent or lessen the threat, such as caregivers, friends and family, and law enforcement without the patient's permission and you have the professional judgment to make that determination of, you know, the threat, is it severe enough that we need to make a disclosure we wouldn't normally make, um, that kind of thing. Now, the Office for Civil Rights wanted to caution about making disclosures to the media, because of course, we have all seen all of the coverage of the pandemic coming out. And so if you were contacted by a member of the media, about information, you may not disclose individually identifiable PHI without the authorization of the patient to the media. So that type of disclosure is not permitted um, without a specific authorization, which requires a HIPAA compliant form to do that process. So of course, if you're just being interviewed in generalities, you're not releasing any individually identifiable health information about a patient, you know, if the media is just like, hey, we want to interview you to see how your practice has been impacted by the pandemic, or how you're going to go about preparing to reopen, if you're getting interviewed for that, of course, you can, can give general information about your practice without disclosing any patient information, and that would be permissible. Next, we're gonna look at disclosures to a correctional institution or a law enforcement official. So again, if there is a correctional institution that has lawful custody of an inmate and they need information to provide care to that inmate or other people in the institution, you can make a disclosure to the correctional institution that has custody of the inmate if needed um, for them to provide healthcare or for them to have the safety of other inmates. So for example, if you saw an inmate and treated an inmate and they were positive for COVID-19, you could disclose that information to the correctional institution. And then in an emergency situation, again, you still have to implement reasonable safeguards. So that requirement, again, has not been suspended. So there is a requirement within the privacy rule that talks about implementing reasonable safeguards to help protect against the unintentional or impermissible uses and disclosure of patient information. So you will continue to apply reasonable safeguards um, in this situation, as you always do. And reasonable safeguards can take many different forms. Um, as I mentioned, one reasonable safeguard when, you know, if you're in normal practice times and you were in your practice and maybe a lot of dental offices have open operatories and you know that the patient in one operatory could easily overhear information that you're discussing with another patient, you might automatically during that time lower your tone of voice to prevent information from being 
unnecessarily disclosed. And so all types of reasonable safeguards that you have implemented or considered should still be in effect during this time. However, one good note for you to be aware of is that the Office for Civil Rights indicated that it will take into account the effects of the outbreak. And of course, I've always, in my dealings over the years, have always noticed that the Office for Civil Rights looks at your good faith efforts. So if they know that, hey, you're being diligent, you have policies and procedures in place, you've trained your staff, you've established safeguards, and something happens, they're going to take all of that into account in their enforcement action. And often, I've seen the Office for Civil Rights, you know, in a situation maybe where a patient complains, and your response comes back and says, well, hey, you know, this is what happened. We acknowledge that something happened here that maybe shouldn't have. The Office for Civil Rights will often take an educational approach and say, okay, we're not issuing any fines here today, but we want you to come up with a plan of corrective action to correct the situation that happened, make sure it doesn't happen again, do some retraining for staff and that kind of thing. So I don't want people to feel panicked about feeling insecure about things. If you have made diligent efforts for HIPAA compliance, then the Office for Civil Rights is going to work with you. Let's take a quick look um, at the next slide, which is civil rights and HIPAA. So there were some issues early on that persons with disabilities were being discriminated against with regard to COVID-19 treatment. That was more in the realm of the provision of respir respirators, ventilators um, for people who were ill. And there was a settlement with a state that was, was discriminating against people with disabilities. So, you know, persons with disabilities have an equal right to obtain healthcare services. They should not be discriminated against in any way. Um, and so that is one thing that you should keep into consideration um, when you're dealing with that situation. Um, and that it also discussed still being able to provide things like if needed, um, interpreters, et cetera, that is still something that is part of um, the, the general discussion. Then next we have, there was a warning from the Office for Civil Rights that unfortunately someone was posing as an Office for Civil Rights investigator and contacting practices. So I wanna provide you with some information that will help you to prevent yourself from being swindled by someone who's representing themselves as someone they're not. And so if you get contacted by someone from the Office for Civil Rights, number one, their email address will end in hhs.gov, period. Secondly, they should have a complaint transaction number or other verifiable information to present to you that you can have to verify the information that they're asking you for. Another thing is that you can direct questions about fraudulent activity to the email address on this slide. That's ocrmail at hhs.gov. So if you get contacted by someone, you suspect that they're not from the Office for Civil Rights, you can actually email that address to obtain assistance. Again, if someone has presented themselves to you, if they are in person, you will ask for their badge, their office, their phone number, and their, their job title if their badge doesn't already have that. Then you can contact that local office and say, hey, you know, I've received a visit from so-and-so, just confirming that they're with your you know, entity, et cetera. Um, I'll, if they're contacting you by phone, always ask for the investigator's email address, which again, will end in hhs.gov and ask them for a, for a confirming email. So if they're on the phone and they're saying, hey, I need X, Y, Z, I'm so-and-so, I'm with the OCR, you can say, hey, please send me a confirming email. Here's my email address. Um, and then I will be able to review that information and respond to you. Some operational issues that you might be dealing with related to HIPAA and COVID-19 are authorizations. And I mentioned this earlier that you know, if you need to facilitate an authorization during this time, you can do so remotely. In fact, there is a provision 
that the Office for Civil Rights has published information about that it would be called an unreasonable measure for you to require a patient to come into your practice to sign an authorization or records release form. So you're not permitted to require in-person signing of those types of forms. And so again, you can remotely facilitate that process. If, a, if one of your patients says, hey, you know what? I really do want my son or daughter, my husband or boy, my wife, one of my friends to be able to get information for, about me on an ongoing basis, you can say, hey, great, we'll facilitate an authorization for that. I can fax, email, or mail you the form. You can return it to us any way you want. And then we'll do some identity verification by checking your signature when it comes back in. Or again, if you receive a form and you're thinking someone forged it, it's one of the, you know, someone who's trying to get information improperly about one of your patients, you're always welcome to call a patient and say, hey, you know, we got this form. It's signed by, purportedly signed by you. We just wanted to make sure and confirm that this is what you wanted and do some identity verification as part of that process. Secondly, you might be getting a new, brand new patient during this pandemic and you've never seen that patient in person. So the question comes up, how do we get the patient our notice of privacy practices? So the Office for Civil Rights has always indicated that is, it is permissible for you to email or otherwise electronically transmit your notice if the patient agrees to receive information via that method. So if you have a new patient who wants to consult with you via telehealth, you can email or fax or even regular mail, the notice of privacy practices, all dependent on what the patient wants. You know, whatever's easiest for everybody, your notice doesn't have any PHI in it, you can send it by unencrypted email if they agree to receive it that way. So that's an easy way to get over that hurdle of providing your notice when you have never yet seen the patient in person. Now, unfortunately, let's look at some of the things that have been going on relative to cyber attacks that are exploiting the pandemic. So, you know, bad actors, they utilize times of crisis as an opportunity to take advantage of the situation and um, transmit malware, ransomware, et cetera. And I, it's unfortunate because, you know, things are already stressful enough and you're dealing with so much and there's information overload and you're trying to obtain the information you need to deal with the pandemic and then here comes somebody um, trying to transmit malware to you. Um, but unfortunately that is the case. So I wanna help educate you on things you can do to prevent malware during this time. So the first one is there are a lot of phishing schemes going on that are using the subject line of coronavirus or COVID-19 as a lure. And so, like I said, everyone's you know, trying to educate themselves on the pandemic situation. And so they're gonna use that in the subject line of the email. And then a lot of times a phishing scheme spoofs, the, the sender spoofs a trusted source. And so they might say, hey, this is the CDC, this is the World Health Organization, this is Dr. So-and-so who's an expert on coronavirus. And then they want you to click an attachment or a link that's going to install or lead you to a malware situation. And so if you receive an email, the easiest way to identify a phishing scheme is make sure first you do not click on any attachments or links, but click on the sender's email address because it will say it's coming from the CDC. But then when you click the actual sender address, you'll see that it's from jkyz at zmz.biz. It's not from the CDC. And in an email that came from the Centers for Disease Control would end in at cdc.gov. And so they're able to display a name to you that is not their actual identity when you click the email address. So once you click the email address and identify that the sender is not legitimate, you just delete that email without clicking on anything, without replying, et cetera. Also, some email schemes, they have not hacked anyone's email address. They, again, are spoofing themselves to be coming from a known source. So someone, and this happened to me this week, 
I received an email from a co from a coworker and it said the coworker's name. And then it was very cryptic, the, the sub, the content of the message. And I was suspicious of it. And so I called the person. And at first I thought that their email had actually been hacked. But when I clicked on the email address that had displayed my coworker's name, that address was not actually his address. So his email box did not get hacked, which is the good news. Someone was just spoofing themselves to be him so that I would respond. And then they wanted an exchange of emails and then they were gonna lead and sort of lure me into an action that would have either contained malware or some type of um, provision of money, monetary funds to the source. So these are all things to watch out for. Um, other things are like coronavirus update, kind of coronavirus emergency, and they'll use your specific city name. So again, they're trying to get very sophisticated to deploy an attack that is going to make you make you click when you normally might be cautious. So even during these times, we're all, you know, email overload is a real thing, even in regular times. I think now you're getting coronavirus information from many, many different sources, including, you know, the MDA and trusted sources. But then, uh, unfortunately, those emails are going to be mixed in with some uh, cyber attack type of emails. And so even file attachments might be named with a coronavirus or COVID-19 theme or name. So again, those attachments you do not want to click on until you've carefully verified the source and authority of where that email came from. Um, and unfortunately, another thing that they're going to be doing is registering a domain that has wording or text related to coronavirus. So, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, cdc.gov and hhs.gov. They might create and register a domain name that says, you know, coronavirus.com. Well, that can be anyone. And so you, again, you have to be careful and verify that the email is coming from a truly trusted source. And then the attacks that they are deploying could be against um, teleworking infrastructure. And we're gonna call, talk about that in just a few minutes. And then also remote access. So they wanna try to gain credentials so that they can deploy a ransomware against your network. Um, I had a client recently, and this was probably, she got the attack before the coronavirus actually was fully in full swing, but she got the ransomware virus on her network. And a forensic analysis thankfully showed that the attacker did lock up their server, but was not able to access or pull any of their PHI or data off their server. However, the forensic investigator identified that it was probably an insider attack, that somebody who worked for their electronic medical records software company either coordinated the attack or sold their credentials to someone who coordinated the attack. And so this is just a quick note for general HIPAA compliance that insider attacks are one of the greatest risks to your information. Um, you know, of course, you have to allow remote access if you have Dentrix or Patterson or whatever your, elect your electronic dental software is, you have to allow remote access from that company but that can be a source of a potential risk and vulnerability. And so you wanna look at protecting that remote access any way you can. You can work with your IT vendor, you could deploy um, two-factor authentication for those people who have to remote in. You could restrict access to only certain IP addresses that you know are coming directly from the electrics, electronic dental software company. Um, so those are types of things that are very insidious attacks that are difficult to prevent, protect, prevent against, but can be very costly. So the Office for Civil Rights has provided some guidance on phishing, how to recognize phishing schemes more readily, um, because they do get more and more sophisticated over time. So some of the things that are warning flags, other than what I've already mentioned, are 
authority is the person claiming to be someone official. They often pretend to be important people from organizations to trick you into doing what they want. Secondly, are they expressing a sense of urgency? Are you told that there's a very limited time period to respond, often 24 hours or immediately? They're threatening you with fines. So they might say, you know, hey, if you haven't done this, you're subject to fines from such and such agency. So they're threatening you with fines or other negative consequences to try to make you panic into taking the action that they want. Emotion, again, the panic that comes into it. They're trying to make you fearful or play on existing fears um, related to the virus, for example. They might use threatening language or false claims of support to attempt you into trying to respond to what they're talking about. And then scarcity. Are they saying that, you know, this whatever is in short supply, a cure, um, PPE, for example, which I know is hard to get right now. Maybe they're representing to you that they can obtain N95 masks that you need for the coronavirus. And again, it's a lure and unfortunately it's an attack. So these are all things, these four things can be used to help you identify a phishing attack and not fall victim to it. However, I, I do want to let you know that the Office for Civil Rights has indicated that entities should plan that a certain percentage of phishing schemes will be successful because of the sophisticated nature um, and also just because of the nature of how all of us are in the information overload age and we're all trying to be efficient and we have to read through our emails as quickly as we can so we can get back to doing other things they know that a certain percentage of phishing attempts will be successful. So you kind of want to plan that ahead with your IT vendor and have talks with them like, hey, what if we do have a phishing attack and somebody falls victim to it? What can we do to mitigate that? What should we do to prevent it? Or what should we do as a response? What, how can we respond to that when it happens? And one of the things that, that you want to do is some, some education with your staff about, okay, Say you get an email and you click something and then you immediately realize, uh-oh, I think I shouldn't have clicked on that. What are our response procedures for that situation? Um, you'll talk with your IT vendor about, okay, what is the proper procedure for someone to follow if they think they've fallen victim to either a phishing scheme or they recognize malware installation on their computer? What should we be doing immediately? Often those steps include disconnecting that device from the network immediately, taking the ethernet cable out, shutting the device down so that the malware, if it has been installed, can't spread to stop the spread immediately. And then making sure that everyone in your practice knows, who do I contact if I think I've gotten malware? Who's my security officer for HIPAA that I should reach out to if I think there's a problem with our computer or networks? so that we can quickly act to mitigate the risks that have, that have just occurred. So those are things to be prepared for as part of your overall security approach with HIPAA related to your computer systems. Teleconference hijacking has become a common thing, unfortunately. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard some stories in the news about Zoom meetings getting hijacked or bombed and people are um, presenting vulgar, racist messages that no one can shut down on that Zoom meeting. And so there are some things you can do if you're using Zoom or any other teleconference methodology. Um, there are some things you can do to, to reduce the threat of a potential hijacking or bombing of your conference. One of them is don't make your meeting public. Um, don't share a public link on a public post. So, you know, if you're if you're hosting an information session about something, don't publish the link to that on a public page or social media post. Email the invitation privately to potential participants. And so that way, someone just in the general public can't obtain the way to log into the teleconference. Then you can manage your settings for screen sharing so that only the host is able to share their screen or allow display of information. So you don't want participants to have the ability to share their screen in the presentation. You also wanna ensure that all of the users are using the current or updated version of your meeting application. 
a lot of times the meeting app will handle that for you. When the person goes to launch it, they ensure that the, the current version is being used. And then address any requirements for security within your organization, you know, making sure that those settings are enabled. Um, I happen to use an application called GoToMeeting. I can produce webinars for my clients with that application. That application has an option for several settings. Um, different applications have different settings, but I'll just share with you the settings that I'm able to control include things like I can put a password on my meeting and require every participant to enter that password in order to be able to join the meeting. And I can share that password in a couple of different ways. So I can send out the, the meeting invitation as one email, and then in a second email, share the password. So it's not even in one place. That's one example of a security method you can take to prevent hijacking of a telehealth appointment or conference. Another thing is you can lock the meeting. So you can actually gatekeep who joins. And that's not helpful if you have a humongous meeting, but for telehealth where you know, hey, I only have one or two participants, one patient might only be joining me, I can gatekeep and allow them to enter the meeting and then lock it after they enter so that nobody else can join the conference once it's started. So those are things you can do to be more private and more secure with your um, teleconferences or telehealth appointments. Next, we're going to look at um, general enforcement in the wake of COVID-19, um, because there's several things to consider for this. The first one is that in any enforcement action, the Office for Civil Rights will consider the circumstances that surround the incident of noncompliance. So again, we talked about this a little bit earlier that, you know, they, there will be consideration given to the circumstances. So for example, if you have a situation where you were delayed in meeting certain compliance requirements, maybe you were due to have a risk analysis and that got delayed because of COVID-19, the Office for Civil Rights is gonna work with you on that and say, okay, you know, yeah, you had it scheduled for this, it's overdue, but you are planning to resume it at this date, and the reason it got delayed was because of the pandemic, they're not going to come down with you with the hammer in that situation. And so that is something that they will consider. They might take an educational approach, um, working with you to correct a penalty without any monetary penalty to you. Again, especially if you have a good faith effort that's been given, um, that would be considered in part of the enforcement action. Next. The Office for Civil Rights will announce when they are ending their enforcement discretion for telehealth. So normally the provision of telehealth requires a secure application, a business associate agreement, et cetera. When the pandemic comes to a point where the Office for Civil Rights feels it's no longer an emergent situation, they will announce that they're ending their enforcement discretion and that any use of telehealth apps going forward would require the full normal compliance elements. And so that there's no current date, essentially. It's, some people have asked, well, when's the end of the enforcement date time? When is this all ending? At this time, it's unknown, but the Office for, for Civil Rights will announce when the enforcement discretion period is coming to a close. And that will then give you an opportunity to say, well, hey, we don't need telehealth anymore, or yes, we're gonna continue telehealth because you know COVID-19 is still around and we're still gonna consult with patients via telehealth before they come into the office. We're gonna triage patients via telehealth. We're gonna continue that going well beyond the current situation. Then at that time, you'd have an opportunity to say, okay, we need to use a secure product. We need to get a business associate agreement in place and go forward at that time. So um, that will be announced by the Office for Civil Rights. Usually um, what I've experienced in the past is that the Office for Civil Rights normally gives um, a compliance date. And so sometimes, and it depends, I don't know for sure what will happen in this situation. This is kind of unprecedented for everyone, but they might say, okay, after this date, you need to ensure that any provision of telehealth is done with full compliance with the, the security rule. And so that's how I foresee it possibly happening. But again, that, that is an unknown at this time. 
So that brings me to the end of my slides. Great. Thanks for having me. Everyone take care.